Hi, I'm Dave, owner of Future Pass Vintage Collectibles, here with my brother Danny. Say hi, Danny. Hello, hello. This is another installment of Comic Book Show and Tell. Today, we're going to show DC Comics some love with some super big keys. Uh, some of these books, my brother has spent a lifetime to collect. And uh, uh, if you don't know, my I sell comic books for a living. My brother collects comic books for a hobby. So let's talk about some comic books today. So I asked Danny, hey, show us some of these books that, that are bigger keys that uh, people might be interested in that you're interested in. And he put a pretty nice stack together. So why don't we just get right to it and talk about comic books. What's first on the stack here, Danny? I started my whole collecting as a DC collector. I mean, I've, I've branched off and I've collected other stuff, but I'm, I'm a DC collector. Okay. Heart. And so, um, and a Silver Age collector. Don't, don't have a lot of Golden Age stuff. So most of the stuff we're gonna see is Silver Age DC keys. Okay, so this first one has got like a really iconic cover, and it's a book that I think uh, a lot of people like, even even if you don't collect series and stuff. And that's uh, Action Two Fifty Two, the first Supergirl. I've had that book in my collection a long time. Um, I collect a big deep run of Action that starts right around the time Supergirl showed up until the early seventies, and I've got them all in that time frame. And I just love this book. I, Supergirl's come to be just a really big key character in the DC universe, and I just think that's a great book. Is this the first appearance of Supergirl? Well, it's the first appearance of uh, Kara, Kara Zor-El, I think. Kara Zor-El. I think that's But there her. was another, uh, was it in action or was it in Superboy where they said introducing Supergirl? Well, there's been like different Supergirls. Like yeah. Superboy 5 had a Supergirl cover and... Uh, yeah. There's an issue of uh, Superman, I think it's 123, that has a Supergirl-like prototype. and So there's been other prototypes, but this is the first of what we consider Supergirl. This is not an easy book to get in high grade. No, I'd say probably starting at about 7.0, it gets um, increasingly difficult and increasingly expensive. You know, the book is not rare, but when you get to the 7.0 and above, it's a much difficult much more difficult book to get. Will you ever upgrade this? No, <laughs> no, good? because it's too expensive, right? Yeah. So like uh, to go up just one bump could almost double the value. Seven five's high grade for that. Yeah, I, yeah seven five's high grade. For I that bought book. that as a raw book from um, a fellow boardy in the CGC boards many years ago, and I got it graded. and I was really happy with it, and it's that's where it stayed right there. Fantastic. Okay. What, what you got next? Next is a book that's like probably one of the most important books to me in my collection because I love the Legion of Superheroes, and you know that. Yep. Some of the earliest stuff I read as a kid were Legion reprints and issues of Superboy, and it made me want to collect adventure comics with the Legion, which is where the original run is. And so I didn't even own a copy of this book until just a few years ago, as mm -hmm. long as I've collected it, because... As my ability to purchase it went up, so did its price. <laughs> and so I, I would kept chasing this book, and then I finally found what I thought was the best copy for me. And that's Adventure 247, First Appearance of Legion of Superheroes. Passed off on a passed up on a really nice six, five years ago that was at half the price of this that I would have really been happy with because I found that eventually the guy who had the six five had it pressed and came back as a seven oh. Yeah. But um I'm just really happy with that copy. I got it some years ago from Heritage, and it's just it just presents really well. Has this is a book that's notorious for having faded colors on the cover. I can see why. Yeah, because it, it's different. It's well, different now. It has that light blue background, but like you can tell on the colors on this one. Look at look at uh, like uh, Superboy's costume and stuff. Look how vibrant the blues and the reds are, and the reds in the word adventure. So. This copy just hit it on all, all marks for me, and I've just been really happy with it ever since I got it. If you had to replace this today, how much do you think this book would go for in seven if, hours? If I was guessing, you know, if there was an auction today, that would be close to a $10,000 book probably. Whoa. So this next one is, in my opinion, kind of a companion piece to the last book we just saw, right? The 247. This is Adventure 300. And this begins the Legion of Superheroes as a series in Adventure Comics. And um, if you're not familiar with the Legion, they had this really convoluted early appearances where 
The first and second appearance were in adventure comics, and the third appearance was in action, and the fourth appearance was in Superboy, and then they had some cameos. But they just became more and more popular, and DC finally let them take over on number 300, and they just came out with this great iconic cover. Um, and I had, I've had copy, this is my third copy of this book. Um, I've upgraded over time, and uh, I finally found, I think, what's my keeper copy. Yes, very nice. What was in Adventure Comics before Superboy? From number 103 through 299, it was all Superboy. But prior to that, you've had Sandman and Manhunter and Golden Aquaman. Age. It was Golden Age before that. Right. And then, so Superboy had his own running series at this time, the same time he was in Adventure. Superboy was introduced in More Fun Comics, and he had a short run in More Fun Comics, and then he moved over and took over Adventure Comics. And he was in Adventure Comics for a couple of years before they came out with his own title, Superboy. Oh, okay. So, so it was Adventure, then Superboy. You know, it's probably hard to believe for somebody, but Superboy was so popular as a character that he ran in two titles, mm -hmm. all from the Golden Age forward. You know, he had his own title in Superboy, and he had Adventure Comics. He's got to grow up at some point. <laughs> he never did. <laughs> okay, next one is a, a series I've talked about before with you a lot. The first series I ever tried to collect to completion and only completed, I don't know, two years ago. So I've been officially collecting comics 50 years. Okay? 50 years. Since I was 11 years old, I've been collecting <laughs> comic books. And I am now 61. <clears throat> And the first thing I ever started to collect was the Brave and the Bold. And this is Brave and the Bold number one. I bought this 10 plus years ago. Um, again, like I've talked about before, it's like sometimes a grade's not the most important thing. It's how it presents. Take a look at this 7 it's got a It's got a dust shadow in the mm -hmm. back, which I know is taking it down yeah. in CGCs. But look at this front cover. Yeah, it's a vibrant book. I've looked at this copy before and... It's just a great looking copy of a 7.0. I don't think you're going to see many Brave and the Bold number ones in any condition out there for sale. You know, there's there's eight O's out there, um, but again, exponentially more expensive than a 7.0 because eight O is, I think, top of census. What's interesting about the dust shadow? It shows look how white the book is right. outside of the dust shadow. It really preserved whatever was on top of this book. Preserved. This is. Phenomenal. What happened in this issue? So uh, what I love about this stuff is I love adventure type series. So this has uh, the Viking Prince and the Silent Knight, which are two characters I really love a lot in the first 24 issues of Brave and the Bold. And so it introduces those two characters along with the Golden Gladiator, who only lasted about five issues. And then they went and added Robin Hood. And he didn't last but till about the middle of, you know, I think number 14 or so. And then they just went just pure Viking Prince and, and um, Silent Night. What I want to point out is the Comic Code Authority size of this right here, 1955. Do you think this book was a result of the seduction of the innocent? And uh, is this the direction they decided to go and to try to mix things up from all the horror and all of the different things that were popular in the day? Well, definitely the number of titles being produced was far down in 1955 because of the number of titles that could not no longer get a code. Right. right? So DC was trying some new things and uh, superheroes weren't as in vogue in the mid 50s that they had been previously. And so right. books like Brave and the Bold popped up. This is a really great series. I just wanted to talk about Brave and the Bold for another second. Is that it lasted for 200 issues from 1959 till about 1982. It wasn't a monthly series. I think it came out like eight times a year. And it started off as this anthology of these uh, adventure characters for 24 issues. And then it became a tryout book that's like a companion to showcase for a while. That's what I had started really liking. And, and well, and then that's we're gonna we're gonna look at some stuff that happened out of that in a second, but. Uh, but then starting in number 59 was the first time Batman had an appearance in Brave and the Bold. Batman eventually took over. It became a team-up book with just Batman. Right. And I, and I love those. I love the whole series. It's just right. I've collected the series to completion. I have the whole 200 issues. And uh, it's just I thought it was going to be like my greatest comic achievement to get a really nice run of Brave and the Bold, but I'm actually working on something that's even harder than that. <laughs> <laughs> With less time. 
Yeah. You have yeah. less time to complete this next one unless you think you got another 50 years. No, I don't, I don't have 50 years left. <laughs> I want to give advice to people right now. Okay. When you're collecting a series, do not do what I did, which is hold out on the most expensive issue to the very end. Now you Be- told me that a long time ago. But you just never took your own advice. I got super picky about about this particular book we're about to see. I got super picky about finding the right copy. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to tell you why. Well, I'm just let me just show you the book, right? Brave and the Bold 28, First Parents of Justice League. I got super picky about this because if you are a person looking for this book, it is predominantly available in cream to off-white, predominantly available in washed-out colors that are faded. And this book was so important to me that I wanted the right copy, but I didn't pursue the copies that fit my criteria enough. And it just kept getting, you know, long, as I got on, this became the last book I needed to complete the run. And that's kind of ridiculous because we're going to talk, yeah. talk about another series I did the same thing on. And it's like I should have learned my lesson, and I didn't. But it got expensive. However, this book has not kept up in value with Marvel keys. What year did this come out? 1960. What else was coming out in 1960 in other publications? You mean like in, uh, in DC or in Marvel? In Marvel. Mar- Marvel was all monster anthology books. It was all, you know, Tales of Astonish, Journey to Mystery. They had, not, they had not jumped the superhero shark yet. No. Uh, the myth, you know, if you want to call it that, is that you know, the, the publisher, you know, the owner of Marvel and, and the DC guys were like golfing or something and the DC were bragging about the sales of the Justice League and Goodman went back and told Stan Lee he wants a team and that's what created Fantastic Four. So at this time, when this book came out in 1960, did Wonder Woman, Wonder Woman had her own series. Flash had been introduced in Showcase, and he had his own series. His own series had just recently started back. Yeah, right. And Martian Manhunter was always a backup story in the Silver the Age, Detective, right? and then House of Mystery. But mostly backups, right? Always backups. Yeah. yeah. In fact, I'm not a hundred percent. Martian Manhunter was on the cover of Detective Two Twenty Five, right? But I don't know that he had many, if any, other cover Covers. appearances since then, and. Somebody told me, and I have not stopped to verify this, that this is the first ever cover appearance of Aquaman on a comic book. I didn't know that. Yeah. That, I, sh- that should be on the label. You know, a uh, Golden Age Guru mentioned that. Okay. In, yeah. a, in a video I saw with him, and I, and I stopped and I thought about it. And I'm like, I don't think the showcase issues are any earlier than this, like Showcase 30, which is the origin of Aquaman in right. the Silver Age. And then with Green Lantern, he had his own series at this point? He had it. Right. But it would have been really early, like a really like in the f- first couple issues. And right. He had his showcase run that he had already done. So yeah, like Danny had mentioned, and this is a really nice copy, by the way. It really that. is. This is um, if you're not if you're not familiar with this book, it's very expensive and it's very hard to find in grade. Um, once you get past six zero, it starts to incrementally. Every half grade is much more expensive. It's the page quality on this that that I know captured you that finding off white to white oh, was so, very tough. I was so happy to get this particular copy and got it at what I thought was a really reasonable price. Like I said, if if this was any Marvel key, it would have been so much more expensive. And uh, it's I don't know why this you know this book does it has an iconic cover, but it's. It's really a weird series, Justice League, the introduction, because they don't introduce the origin of the team in this story. They act as if they'd already been together. Okay. And Do you think they knew that they were going to run with this when they put it out, or they were just trying yeah, to fill an issue? I'm sure somewhere out there there's a story of how DC decided to do this, but like, it's just kind of bizarre that you know, they didn't, they didn't like have an origin story right from the beginning and you know and they didn't want Superman and Batman to be a part of the Justice League initially because they were really trying to highlight their other hero characters and Superman and Batman had multiple titles already. So it was the Justice Society before this? Justice Society ended about 10 years earlier than this. And that was the first superhero team? Uh, that's a good good question. I mean uh, they started an all-star number three so like maybe 1940. So they lasted about 10 years in All-Star Comics, went, went from number three to 57. And, uh, and then as superheroes faded out, 
you know, got titled, got changed to All Star Western, and, right? And, and and away went the superheroes. But uh, yeah. how many of the, your key books have Murphy Anderson coverage of them? Oh boy, that's good. I mean, because um, Murphy Anderson was like king of the roost here. This is pre Neil Adams covers. This is like a different era for DC. Yeah, it is. And you know what I really appreciate about this? This, like I said, is kind of iconic. And I'm sure a lot of people. You know, make fun of the fact that the Justice League's fighting a starfish, right? That's Starro. <laughs> I know. <laughs> he's a starfish, right? Well, he's a big starfish from yeah, outer space. Yeah, but I got to tell you, I loved the Suicide Squad movie. Love. That had Starro in it. I thought they made Starro a real le- legitimate, you know, villainous character. He was fantastic. He was. <laughs> it was a great movie. Stole the show. Well, that's, that's a great book you're not going to see often. What else you got? Well, let me let me grab those two because these are two? these are kind of companion pieces. I'll just show these two at the same time. Is a so because I'm a brave and a bold completist, right? I got to have you know 29 and 30 also, and it it's a fluke. I didn't plan it this way, but I ended up with all three of them in seven five. All the great pages. You know, one of these has a, a off white, and the other's off white to white, but all really great pages. Nice presenting copies just a really solid trio that this is the first three justice leagues are these easier to get than that yeah I know they're not going to be as expensive i would say the 20 great, great robot cover by the way <laughs> the 29 is harder than the 30 the 30 i really love the pink cover with the two what is it with tubes and heroes you know you see tubes and in, in girls and tubes and heroes but uh, i love this cover it's pink and it's got a you know, they're stealing the powers of the Justice League and putting them in this guy. It's just, it's just a great cover. Yep, good stuff. One of my favorite, favorite books and stories from the Silver Age. Uh, read this as a reprint when I was a kid in, an issue, in a DC 100-page Super Spectacular with Superboy. This is the first appearance of the Teen Titans, or the team that will be known as the Teen Titans. It doesn't say Teen Titans it doesn't, anywhere in there. Nowhere in here does it say and, Teen Titans. And who's Titans. missing? Who's missing in this? Wonder Girl. Yeah. Yeah. And we could do a whole episode about how <laughs> foobard the whole Wonder Girl thing is, right? Because, yeah. Because, real briefly, Wonder Girl is really Wonder Woman as a girl, right? It's supposed to be. But then they somehow screwed up, and, and the, whoever wrote it thought it was a separate character, added her into Brave and the Bold 60, and then DC had to come back and retcon the whole Wonder Girl origin later. But that's a great book. So in, in, in the universe, what did she become if she was not Wonder Woman? Was she another Amazonian? or No, I don't believe one. The Wonder Girl that was in Wonder Woman comics at this time, because there was a Wonder Tot, a Wonder Girl, and a Wonder Woman, right? Yeah. But it was... It was no different than Superman being super, super baby, boy, yeah, super boy, yeah. super, right? Right. But then when they wrote the Teen Titans and added Wonder Girl in, somebody forgot that from a timeline perspective, it wouldn't work because at the Wonder same Woman time... Wonder Woman was Wonder Woman then. Wonder Woman was Wonder Woman then, and now they're adding a Wonder Girl yeah. at the same time. But this is a great book. Love it. This, this is a book I've always kind of chased after. And I when I got back to collecting, I started going right after these. But one day I'll own a copy of this myself. Let me tell you a funny story about this particular copy, though. So this is an 8.5, and, and you know I like high-grade stuff. And there's you can get higher-grade. It's a really nice presenting 8.5. I bought this as a PGX 7.5 on a oh. Comic Link auction like 12 years ago and paid like 200 bucks for it. I just looked at the scan, and I said... That looks better than a 7.5. I got it, Dave. I broke it out. Didn't even press it, clean it, even though that, was, that wasn't as prevalent as it is today. Yeah. Just sent it straight into CGC wow. and got an 8.5. That's insane. I just, you know, look at the book. <laughs> yeah. And PGX. Nobody respects PGX, really, as a grading company. But What you just told me doesn't make me respect them anymore. Well, it makes me respect that I got it so cheap. Yeah, no, they're good. Yeah, they're good buys. They can be good buys. I've done PGX. I've bought PGX books and improved them. So yeah. Okay, so back here comes to a, here comes a dandy. It's a dandy, but let's go back to my story about not saving the most expensive book for the end, right? <laughs> so big collector Superboy stuff, and what book did I hold out on till the very end was Superboy one? Again, I got super 
picky about what kind of copy I want. This is not a rare book, Dave. You can, you can go out on the websites and find copies of Superboy 1 every day. Maybe not in 8.0 or better, but definitely you can find copies. Problem is, is this book is notorious for having the staples way like half inch or more into the cover. Yeah, he's, or, he's just showing, and you've seen this, where they, instead of stapling at, at the seam where it bends, sometimes they literally stapled here, which was problematic because when you open the book, it starts it to tear. Creates, it creates reader creases. And you get a reader crease running along yeah. the front here and on the back. So this this is actually has good staple placement. So, um, these were thicker books too, yeah. Yes, yeah, these are these are the back when there were 52 pages, but mm -hmm. notorious things about this book. Again, faded cover because it's got that bright yellow, so you see a lot of the times the yellow is faded. You see a lot of uh, grease pencils and other markings that show up in the cover because the cover shows dirt so, so poorly or so much. And then the cover is so miscut sometimes. This is one of those books where it has two DC bullets. Mm -hmm. And so like, if you're looking at books from this time frame, you're looking at them to be square and level across the top. You don't, I don't like it when I see it miscut and it like it starts off right and then it's like it cuts into the DC bullet at the edge. So I got really picky and, and my friend Ken Spencer used to tease me about the fact that why do you save the most expensive book for the end? You should be doing that first. And he's right. I should be. But I got picky and he's, he's about the pickiest collector I know so he, <laughs> he appreciates that. Right. But um, I just got really picky and when I saw this copy come up I'm like okay. I found my copy and I'm laying down and I got it and I got had this since uh, 2017. Beautiful book. This book uh, is a key, um, probably not a big key in some people's perspective. You know, oh, this I don't is, know about that. This is Lois Lane number one. Um, Lois Lane had a tryout series in Showcase number nine and ten. Those books don't excite me, and I've never actually wanted to get them. I don't collect Showcase. Uh, but I, I do collect Lois Lane. I have a complete run, all 137 issues. Ran from 1958 to about 1973, at which time Superman family took over Lois Lane and Jimmy Olsen. Um, it's got kind of a classic cover if you're a Superman collector. It's a, it's a really nice copy. This book is notoriously hard to get in, in nice shape because of the dark blue cover. Yeah. Um, this was originally a CGC 6.5 in, oh. in an old label, but I cracked it out because at that time when I was collecting this book, so I've had this book a long time, at that time I was cracking all my CGC books out, right? I got to a point where I decided I really wanted my big keys back in slabs. I, I sent it back and it regraded as a 6.0, but it's a really nice looking copy. Copies above 6.5, go for so much money that I'm not motivated to try to upgrade. Right. It's a nice copy. It presents well. And as hard as that one is to find in nice shape, this one is harder. So this what do we have here? Jimmy Olsen number one. Superman's pal, Jimmy Olsen. Yep. Pre-code. First three issues of this series were pre-code. My understanding is this series is kind of like an offshoot from the Superman TV show. Jimmy Olsen was popular and DC was capitalized on the popularity of the TV show came out with Jimmy Olsen in his own comic. So there was a television show in the 50s that featured George Reeves as Superman. And if you'd ever watched that, and Danny and I watched it religiously, it was black and white. Um, it really focused on the relationship of Superman as Clark Kent and Superman with Jimmy Olsen and Lois Lane. And, yeah. and what was the publisher's name? Uh, Perry White. Perry White. Who else was featured in that show? Oh. What bad guys? Well, they usually, they weren't like super villains. Usually. There was no Lex Luthor. Yeah, or... not that I recall. I mean, there was like, I forgot how many seasons that show ran, like maybe eight seasons. I haven't watched an episode of that in decades. You know, there was an episode of I Love Lucy where Superman, where George Reeves was on there as Superman. I want to watch that. <laughs> Crossover. Okay. But uh, this copy, um, I've had a really long time. I did something that today everybody would think is really a bad mistake. I sold really high grade ASMs <laughs> to buy this book. So you sold Amazing Spider-Man copies that were yeah, like, expensive. Yeah, like, like 12, 12 and 15 cent Spider-Man, cover price Spider-Mans that were like solid near mints. They were from the Monterey collection that you've talked about many times. Yep. 
I bought those books from the original owner and I sold those to buy this. This book today is still <laughs> worth what I paid for it. <laughs> and the Spider-Mans are worth a lot more. But I do have a complete run of Jimmy Olsen. Jimmy Olsen ran from 1954 to 1974, 163 issues. And then the numbering changed to Superman Family and it ran until issue 222. So it's okay. really a long, long run series. Yep. Um, so the last three books I have are you're not... Saving, you're saving the best for last, aren't you? Um, I'm saving the coolest for last. <laughs> <laughs> so these three books are non-superhero DC keys. Mm -hmm. uh, you know I collect some really eclectic or obscure stuff. Um, the first one I'm going to show is The Three Mouseketeers by Sheldon Mayer, the creator of Sugar and Spike. And um, this is uh, number one in a really nice shape with great page quality, just a nice bright white cover. Um, I don't have a whole run in this. In fact, I only have a few ish. This, this series is so difficult to get in high grade, any issues, that if I saw an issue in high grade, I would just buy it regardless of what number it is. Right. It'd be that hard to get. But it's a really, you know, they always struck me as being derivative of the mice on Cinderella, right? Yep. I think that they, they, they swiped it, yeah, personally. Next one, I've showed this to you before, but it kind of fits the, the motif of what we're doing here today. Sugar and Spike, number one. Mid-grade copy, 5.5. Five, super nice. One of the nicest copies you'll find, really. I, I, I think, I didn't look up in the census, but it's probably towards the top of the census because there are no copies right. of this that are much higher. That cover looks great. It's... It's a, it's a super tough book to get. Um, it's considered, I don't know, I don't know if I'd go like rare or scarce, but it's really an uncommon book. And then it's, it's definitely more difficult to get in higher grade. And you talked about the Comics Code Authority. Look at the size of that thing. Yeah, so you know in 1955 when the Comic Code Authority started printing, they, they took up a piece of the cover. And if you look later on, it gets just micro small. So that's if you ever see that that size, you know you're dealing with a book 55, 56. Yeah, and uh, this, maybe this is the best for last, right? Best for last, he says. Okay, this is. I have a whole run of this series, Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer. It's a book that was published annually by DC once a year. Probably came out around September of each year. And they would let the issues stay on the stands until Christmas time. So it always yeah. had Christmas themed covers. Came out once a year from 1950 to 1962. There was 13 issues. I have got all 13 and I'm about two or three issues away from having them all be better than fine. And in many cases, I've got Eidos and, and, and such. But this is by far the best copy in existence. It's a pedigree. Um, which I think is the only way you could ever get a copy of this book selfie. That night. Ru Rudolph does a selfie. <laughs> yeah, this is a super nice copy. It is. It's a nine two. Wow. Um, yeah. Look at look at like again. You talk about covers that are notoriously difficult, like miscut, dirty, or whatever. Uh, and this this is just like a really beautiful copy. And so uh, I've got like the number two of this in eight five and. I've got several Eidos. Uh, just, I started collecting these because I thought they were fun, and then I found out to be what a challenge they were. And I'm still like, been collecting this series for over 30 years, and I'm still about three issues that I need to upgrade to have my set be. How many like, total issues? There's 13. 13, yep. But I, I have them all, but I need three that I have to upgrade in order to have the set be like at the condition that I want them to be at. You have a world-class Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer collection. I, no, I have the best. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it for DC. Uh, we just wanted to show you some of Danny's books that uh, he's spent a lifetime getting together, and uh, they're fantastic. So hopefully you enjoyed that, and uh, stay tuned. We have some more stuff in the future. But uh, thanks for spending time with us today. Thanks. Thanks.